You're listening to the Reason Bound Podcast, where it's not what you believe, but why that matters. Now, here's your host, Ryan Michaels. Welcome to the Reason Bound Podcast. I am Ryan Michaels. Today, I am here with someone named Stephanie Drury. And I actually came across a page that Stephanie runs on Facebook several years ago, probably back in 2009, 2010. Um, the page is called Stuff Christian Culture Likes, and there's a lot that I want to ask her and discuss. How are you doing today? Good. How are you? I could not be better. It's actually the weather's finally warming up in Tokyo, which you're either it's either so hot you're puking or so cold you're turning into a snowman. Oh, nice. How's the weather where you are? It's I'm in Seattle and it's actually really pretty today. It's the first day that feels like spring. And speaking of Japan, I saw cherry blossoms today. So when does that happen in Japan? Right about now for about a week or for about two nice. weeks. Yeah, cherry blossom. What one thing that's nice about Japan is uh especially when the the uh cherry blossoms happen, public drinking is encouraged. Like it's a cultural thing. So people will go out with their sake and sit under a cherry blossom with their friends and just get smashed. It's a lot of fun. I've seen footage of that and everyone looks like everyone's dressed impeccably. It looks like they're <laughs> out of a movie and they're just rolling around drunk under the cherry blossoms. And I'm like, oh, I want to go to Japan. And it's really a safe um it's a really safe country too. Like a lot, you know, a lot of businessmen, it's really common to be walking down the street, you know, especially on the weekends and you'll just see some drunk businessman just, you know, sleeping on the street in a impeccable suit with his briefcase with him. And in the morning he just wakes up, gets on the train and goes home. So yeah, it doesn't have to worry about crime, like not a big, <laughs> yeah, it's crime not a big rate. thing. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's a totally different culture. I was always looking over my shoulder you know, even when I'd go on a late night run in the States here, it's like, oh, you know, the worst that'll happen is a Tanuki will run up to you and that's about it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so stuff Christian culture likes, um, a very, very brief history for me. I grew up in quite a religious household, pretty fundamentalist. And the difference between me and a lot of the people, not only in my family, but some of the other people that my family brought around our family, um, the main difference was that there came a time when I just couldn't overlook so many different questions I had. I thought a lot of the stuff that was going on in the churches that we attended was strange. And I took my religion real, real, real seriously. And I started studying as much as I could, whether it was the Greek, Hebrew, or Aramaic, or, um, you know, as far back as I could go when it came to different texts we have. And I started seeing how our English translation of the Bible in some cases is very, very different from maybe the meaning or intent of what was oh, originally written. Yeah. yeah. So I got, I, there was a period of time when I was really angry and I felt like I was duped, not duped in the sense that these people around me maybe intentionally misled me because they were sincere in their beliefs, but duped in the sense that these people were supposed to be so holy and know so much, and really they didn't know anything and they didn't seem to care to. And so I was really, really angry. And for a period of years, if anyone even said the word Christian, it's just like I would see red and just get right. really angry quick. And so I overreacted and I had to mend a few friendships as a result of how I was during uh, that period of time. But then I started finding more liberal Christians. I came across pages on Facebook, such as the Christian left and so forth. And I was in, and even some of my own friends. And I realized, oh, okay, so not everyone, the, the Fundy household that I grew up in is not a representation of everyone else. And your page, when I first came across it, <laughs> I thought my first uh, idea was I thought, oh, this must be kind of like a atheist or anti-theist page and just kind of just bashing the religion. But the more I spent some time on it, I realized that that's not what it was. And every post I saw really resonated with me. And I thought, mm -hmm. oh, okay, so they're talking openly about all these crazy ideas that never made sense to me that if I ever brought up with someone else, they'd give me some circular logic or bizarre reasoning for why it has to be this way. And it was really refreshing. And it came across as my idea of you before I spoke with you was that you were someone that 
likely was still either Christian or believed in God and yet was, had just become exasperated with what, um, you saw as conventional wisdom when it comes to what Christianity is. So if you would, um, would you mind sharing basically your motivations for starting the page and what you personally believe these days? Oh, sure. Um, I started it in about 2008. I, it was, this was a blog back when people blogged. Um, I went on a road trip with my atheist friends who were talking about the election because this was when Barack Obama was first running. Mm. And they asked, how come all the Christians are against Obama because he wants to end the war? He's, he's a pacifist. And I go, Oh, I know all about that. Let me tell you about why. Cause I, I'm a preacher's kid. I grew up in Arkansas, Southern Baptist preacher's kid. And wow. I, I just knew the culture inside and out. And so around that time, the stuff white people like book was big. And I was like, you know, I kind of know a lot about this. Let, this is kind of fun. And I had just started therapy and I was starting to challenge these things. And so I just, I started this blog, selfchristianculturelikes.com, just riffing on the stuff white people like and, and started talking about kind of cultural stuff. And then it got into the deeper stuff where inerrancy of scripture, you know, Christian culture needs to absolutely cling to the idea that this shit written 4,000 years ago that wasn't recorded until, you know, 80 years after Jesus walked the earth, you know, they didn't even write that down for a really long time. Um, so why, why, why do we need to cling to that being inerrant? So kind of, uh, it, it's, it's pretty complex because I, I, I say complex, like it's really deep. No, it's just, it's very, um, a lot of elements in play because I was kind of processing my own faith and my questioning and, um, everything coming together for me, watching the selection happen, watching how angry the Christians were that someone would try to stop the war when Jesus was the ultimate pacifist. And mm. um, so in, in since I started it in the almost 10 years, I've, I've left two different churches. Um, just, I don't go to church anymore in any kind of formal sense of the word, but I am drawn to, to Catholic cathedrals. For some reason, I like to sit in them when they're empty, when no one else is there. And um, I, so I, I retain some curiosity and I'm not an atheist, but I absolutely respect anyone's leanings towards atheism or what, whatever resonates for them mm. is needs to be, is, is, is the most important thing because you can't tell someone what their experience is. You need to listen to their experience and, and to what got them there. You can't impose on them your belief system in any way. That's just, it's so glaringly obvious to me that that's, that's abuse. And so the only way you can get anywhere good is by listening to someone and sharing their experience. So I'm, I'm hoping to foster that with stuff Christian culture likes. I don't delete comments. I don't ban users. It's kind of a triage center for people who are burned by religion and they've never had a place to, to dismantle it and talk badly about it. So that's kind of what I hope to provide. I really, your description of your page, I think it it really resonated with me, and I think it's really beautifully written. Do you mind if I read that for the people listening real quick? No, go ahead. So if you go to the Facebook page, Stuff Christian Culture Likes, and click under About, the description of the page states, This forum is for people who have been harmed by Christian culture. Posting evangelical trends and then deconstructing them helps them see that the ideas presented to them all their lives actually can be challenged safely. To offset some of the echo chamber risk, I post good things as well as sobering things and I don't ban users or delete comments. This page is a space for people who have never had a place where they can speak their true feelings that don't look pretty. After we got this out, and it often takes a while to recover from because it was drilled into us for so long, we can emerge with true positivity and hope. It is such a beautiful thing when abuse survivors can offer the world something more than their sneer. Until then, they can vent here. I completely understand if it's not your scene. Of course, there's a lot to unpack there potentially, but I, especially when you're talking about being able to discuss, you know, their true feelings and ideas safely and that you can challenge things that don't make sense. The way I interpreted that is I, I was always terrified of being guilty of thought crime. Mm -hmm. You know, when Mm -hmm. I was a Christian, I thought if I think the wrong thing, or if I question this, or, you know, I'm just, it's a one way ticket to being barbecued for all eternity. Is that the type of thing you had in mind when you wrote that? Yeah, that's, that's one thing. I mean, every, everything though, um, you know, 
all the purity, the sexual stuff, mm. all of the cussing stuff, all of it's it's just if if you if they believe in a god that's so weak that you can't think something independent, then why would you want to serve that god? Like it'd be worth it to be barbecued for eternity <laughs> to me. Right. So um, I don't think I don't think if God is real, I don't think they're that fragile. So um, if I don't we, have any. Go ahead. No, I'm I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go, you go ahead. Oh, I was basically done. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's probably one thing that gets uh, confused. One more thing that I want to touch on that uh, we had just brought up when it comes to belief and non-belief. Um, a lot of people confuse atheism with anti-theism. And so for people listening, when I say I'm an atheist, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm anti-theist. I would have to, first of all, know, you know, what God we're talking about to decide whether or not I like the idea of that God and so forth. And it's not like tomorrow, if I was convinced that a God existed, I would deny it. I would just say, wow, my gosh, you know, this changes quite a few things. I just don't currently hold the belief. And sometimes people will say, uh, well, you should be an agnostic. And I'm both. I'm an agnostic atheist. And a quick rundown. I did this in my second podcast, but I think it's appropriate here and I can do it quickly. Basically, Gnosticism and, agnostic and agnosticism has to do with uh, knowledge claim. So a Gnostic theist will say, I believe in God. I know that there's a God. An agnostic theist will say, I believe in a God, but I'm not sure that I'm right. A Gnostic mm -hmm. atheist will say, I don't believe in a God and I know there's not a God. And an agnostic atheist such as myself, my position is, well, I, I don't hold a belief in a God, but I don't know that I'm right. I, you know, I could be wrong. I'm not making a claim of knowledge that I know one doesn't exist. So mm -hmm. what I like that. Where would you put yourself? It sounds like you might be either. It's really rare that I meet an agnostic theist, but it sound. Are you convinced of your belief or? Um, no, I, I mean, yes and no. And mm. that's why I, when you called whatever you described yourself, I, I pr probably resonate with that a lot. But then, um, I, you know, like I said, I'm very drawn to Catholic cathedrals and I have a lot of icons around that, um, that may that have meaning for me. Mm. And this just comes out of my own personal experiences um, that are, that are subjective and I'm not going to, I wouldn't tell anyone that they need to believe what I believe because I haven't, you know, they haven't had my experiences and I haven't had theirs and, and, you know, everything that, that resonates for each of us is absolutely informed by what we've experienced. So I'm, I'm much more, I'm, I'm not interested in, having someone believe what I believe I'm interested in what other people believe. <laughs> I want to, you know, tell me about your experiences that right. how was that for you? That's, that's kind of where I am. And I think that's where church and religion get it wrong. They try to impose from the outside something that, you know, the sacred experience that it's all, it's kind of the fingers pointing to the moon thing. Like, like why, why stand here and talk about the moon when you can be on, you know, um, what the disconnect is seems to be what drives people from the church. Right. You know, because they're trying to trying to impose something that that doesn't resonate for them. So I, I'm just like, let's talk about what we do know, which is what we've experienced, and how can we have relationship, and how can we heal each other by through love, through through community. You know, one of the things that I think really drive. Well, I'll just speak for myself. One of the things that drove me from the church was recognizing that. Um, some fundamentalists, they just seem to be totally incapable of adopting another person's worldview or understanding how other people feel or think. And I remember I was very troubled before I eventually left the faith, but, but I sincerely, sincerely, no one wanted to have faith more than I did. Like I mm -hmm. really wanted to believe like very strongly. I pray, I, I would walk the streets crying at night, just pr mm. doing nothing but praying. And I mm. remember listening to Ray Comfort and Ray Comfort. Who, I only know the name I, I, and, and the face, but I can't place what he did or who he was. <laughs> He's also known as the banana man. He's the one that, um, oh, okay. Yeah. Got, got it. <laughs> Kurt, Kurt Cameron's buddy. <laughs> yeah, all right. That guy. <laughs> So I would hear him say around this time, he was making comments about how it's just not true that no one believes in a God. Everyone believes in a God, but you're just rejecting him because of your sins. I And it was because of Ray Comfort in part that I finally 
just realize that these people don't know what they're talking about, people like him. And I, and like he helped push me into atheism because I realized this is a man that doesn't have truth. I mean, I know I was trying to be so puritanical in my thoughts in following Jesus or what I thought I was supposed to do, what different people were telling me to do, even ideas from people like Ray Comfort. And it just, it, there was just nothing there. It was just empty and completely hollow. When you hear someone like Ray Comfort talk, and when you hear people say things like, no, 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 everyone believes in a God. It's just that they're lying to themselves because they love their sin. How do you interpret that mindset? Why do you think that someone, because I think they're sincere when they say these things. I think Ray Comfort really believes that, but how do they get that ingrained? I think that they're speaking from a lot of fear. I just hear fear in that because they're not able to think about what I shouldn't say they're not able to because that's condescending. They're able to. They don't want to think, what would it be like if I abandoned this belief system Mm. and was able to think outside of that? Because if they do that, their scaffolding will completely fall. They've constructed scaffolding around their worldview, Mm. and they're terrified of what will happen when that falls. But if that did fall, that would probably be the best thing that ever happened to them because they would probably spin out. They'd be forced to have compassion for people around them, and then they might actually start acting out of love instead of fear. That's what I think when I hear that Ray Comfort said that. One of the most uncomfortable feelings that I can recall having is I'm pretty much a proponent and a believer that people don't choose what to believe. I don't think there's anything right now that I could choose to believe. I think people become convinced for good or bad reasons about Mm -hmm. different things. And there was a point in time in my transition from believing to having doubts, to becoming an atheist, where I realized I I could feel it inside and I could feel like I couldn't deny the truth that some of this wasn't holding up. And I could either just go, you know, la, 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 with my fingers in my ears and just, and just try and bury myself in as much propaganda as possible. Or I could just try and face the truth. And I really did spin out. And that was really mm-hmm. uncomfortable. And it was like, I, I remember being in a parking lot um, for some reason and just thinking a lot about some of these issues that didn't make sense and finally admitting to myself, yeah, this, this isn't right. This, I can't, mm-hmm. I can't square this up. And I remember thinking my heart was just going to beat out of my chest. It was so uncomfortable. And so I think for a lot of people that have, ne- first of all, did you ever used to be, um, a fundamentalist yourself? And did you have that same experience where suddenly your worldview and like the scaffolding that you had built up started to come crashing down before you rebuilt it? Oh, definitely. How did that go? Yeah. Um, well, it, I, it sent me to therapy. Mm. I, um, had a, like a nervous breakdown when yeah. I, when it really became clear to me, it just kind of was like, it slammed into my consciousness. What if all of this was a lie? And, um, the, the feeling of betrayal from your family, from your community, um, just the long con and feeling like, yeah. <laughs> who would who would have orchestrated this? You know, this is just nothing but devastating. So I went to therapy and I didn't really seek a Christian counselor, but I got one who said to me, can you make a space to ask yourself, is God real and is God good? Mm. And she told, and that saved, that really probably saved my my sanity. I I just didn't know how to hold that together because the fundamentalism, the black and white thinking Mm. hadn't led me into any kind of duality. I hadn't been able to think, well, maybe there's, there's a world between good and bad. Maybe Mm. there's a lot of space in between these black and white concepts that are actually okay and, and more beautiful than, than the absolutes. (laughs) So I've been looking listening to a lot of Richard Rohr. He's a Catholic priest who is is pro, who should be on the outs with the Catholic Church because he embraces a lot of new age stuff and mysticism. Hmm. But he's so he's so old that they they kind of let him around and I I really appreciate the stuff he writes about that um about how you have to deconstruct in order to reconstruct. You absolutely have to go through that anger phase. You have to go through it. You have to in order to rebuild something because it's like I said in the the description, it's so ingrained in us that we, we, it takes a while to tear down. And, but when, what, whatever we start building from that is from our own experience. And that's, that will actually have integrity rather than this fundamentalist system that was handed to us that we're just kind of copying and, and hoping that we can suffice at so we don't get barbecued, like you said. Right. 
So that's very interesting. So you and I had basically the same type of thing, like basically a nervous breakdown and we had to find an identity or we had to discover who we were apart from the dogma mm -hmm. that had been hammered into our heads. I, we both, I guess, went different routes. So for me, I started basically with a blank slate and I thought, I'm just, I don't even know what's, I'm just gonna, from today forward, I'm just going to assume that I don't know anything. And then as things come, I'm going to test it against my own reason, common sense. I went there. Same? Yeah, yeah. I, I like wouldn't call myself a Christian. I wouldn't, I, I almost call myself an atheist, but I couldn't quite. So I, was, I probably would be where you were. Yeah. Okay. So how did you, how, how was it that you found, so you went through the, the anger stage. You said you're in the same place I was where you were like, okay, I, I, I don't know what's true or false anymore, but we'll just start with a blank slate. How was it that you found your way, I don't want to say back to, because I don't know if you ever completely, I guess you said you didn't <laughs> completely stop believing, but was that, was that just one thing that was, for me, that was, that was included when I wiped everything off the table, the belief in a God. For you, was that the one thing maybe that stayed on the table that you just never? Whoosh? No, I, I wiped it. I wiped it. Well, I was, I was like, you're going to have to prove yourself to me. Oh, if... really? You're real. Yeah. I, I made God prove itself. Told it told it, her, she, they, whatever. Okay. Um if you if you're real and if you're good, uh, I'm just I'm I'm tired of being taken for an idiot by this religion stuff. And um you're just gonna have to show up. And so I feel like um a lot of love came towards me after that mm -hmm. point. I I found I was in good relationships. I found actual loving people because of that spin out, I was able to see, Oh, someone who would say that or treat me that way. That's not loving. And I was mm. kind of able to filter, filter out things. I just had a lot of things that I can't explain kind of come towards me in a really benevolent way that I'd never experienced before. Mm. So you can, you know, you can call that God, you can call that the universe. You could call it luck. You know, I still don't really know what it is, but, um, and so I don't, and I don't want to name it because it, that almost seems like it would debase it, <laughs> but, mm. um, it felt, it felt like whatever energy I was putting out, it, it was met with respect and reciprocity. It sounds, it sounds like if I had to sum up my time in, um, the fundamentalist upbringing in the church that I was being sent to and everything in one word, it would be confusion. Mm. And mm -hmm. if you had to sum up your time in one word before, as you say that, um, whatever will term, whether it's universe, God or whatever, bef before you had that change, how would you sum up, if you could sum it up in one word, would it be confusion? Would it be similar to that? How, how um, I felt the word I would use would be control. I felt like mm -hmm. it was, had been used to control me and intimidate me through fear. And you recognize that at the time that you were going through it or only looking back? Looking, I, you know what, when I, when it finally hit the fan, that's, it hit the, I reacted the way I did. I broke down because it finally broke through from my subconscious to my consciousness. Mm. They were trying to control me. They didn't love me. Mm. They they were trying to control me out of fear. This has been a fear-based thing, which is the opposite of love. You know, hate isn't the opposite of love. Fear is. <laughs> and you would agree with me that these people, in, in their minds, what they think love is, they sincerely believe that what they were doing was loving is the scary part to me. Much of the time, yes. Much, right. Yes. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Much of the time. Yeah. Speaking of stuff that Christian culture likes, um, <laughs> I, <laughs> your Facebook, man, people really need to go check it out. Um, there's a few things that I wanted to ask your insight about. There's a few things in particular that have always really disturbed me. And, um, one, one thing in particular that you've posted about. Uh, there, there's two main topics, but the first one, just to me, it's the most disturbing. So I thought we'll just get this out of the way first. <laughs> when we start talking about the daddy daughter dates and the purity oh, balls, God. um, yeah. every time I see the, for people who don't know, there's, um, you can look up articles on purity balls and it's where fathers will basically, you know, dress up like it's prom night with their daughters. I've seen, you know, in a lot of the pictures, these girls look like they're seven, eight years old and they're in these gowns and they'll have pictures where they're sometimes kissing each other on the lips and they're going on dates and exchanging rings and the, the daughter is promising her virginity to her father. Every time that I 
see these men in these pictures, my first thought is, I really hope the FBI is checking out their browser history. Mm -hmm. It just seems like it's a sexualization of not only children, but your own children. And I can't figure out why some sects of Christian culture views this as not only okay, but like a virtuous thing. Like, do you have any insight Mm -hmm. into why this is happening? The patriarchy. It's, it's normalized. The patriarchy is completely normalized. Um, you're grooming girls to be property of their fathers until their father can make them property of their husband. And it's disgusting. And all I can, the only word I can use is normalization, because if you say it like that, you're like, Ooh, that's gross. And then you see it happening. You're like, Oh, well, that could be a good thing because you know, they're going, it's, isn't that sweet. She trusts her daddy. You know, the daddy daughter relationship is really, is really special. Girls are formed you know, by their relationship with their daughters to their fathers. So, you know, that's such a big component of their emotional development, which is true. You know, Mm -hmm. you can spin it, you can put such good spin on these evil things that, that it works. I mean, look at the current administration, look at brave new world, look at animal farm. It's all the same thing, you know? Uh, One of the things you wrote on your website, stuff, Christian culture likes.com about this issue is uh, you said, If fathers were instead reading about female psychology and relational intimacy, instructions on how to facilitate bonding through dates wouldn't be necessary, as they would be organically acting out of their desire to know their daughters and honor them. But we don't live in that kind of world. And I felt so many times with adults that uh, I was surrounded by growing up that it was always this... Like, we're going to go through the motions of what we think we're supposed to do and what we think God wants. And there was very little that felt organic or felt natural. It was all centered on, um, you know, oh, you played Super Mario World today? How is that honoring Christ type of thing? <laughs> and it's <laughs> <laughs> so dead on. <laughs> and, <laughs> And I remember asking a guy at my church and he, he, or at one of the churches I went to and he was just hammering us in youth group. He said, everything you do, everything Uh, you do, you need, you need to be thinking of God while you do it and honoring God. And he was big into football. I was never big into football. Oh God, a jock. Oh my God. (laughs) I asked him, I said, cause the Super Bowl was coming up and I said, well, when you watch football, do you think of God the whole time? And he, and he, and he looked at me like he was like, just not expecting it. And he goes, well, I try to. And I thought that's the most honest answer he could probably, of course he doesn't. And I knew even at that age. (laughs) And of course he feels guilty about it. And of course he tries. Did you ask him if he thinks about God while he's jerking off? (laughs) You know, I, seriously, I was too young to know what jerking off was at that point in time. So no, no, I, I didn't ask him that question, but if I run into him these days, maybe I will. Yeah. Friend him on Facebook. and (laughs) Wow. It's weird. I mean, I got, not only was I, did I feel guilty for my own impure thoughts? I mean, things that aren't even impure, just things that I thought maybe, maybe it's too close to the edge of the fence of impurity. But when I'd watch a movie or a TV um, show, if someone said, Oh my God, I'd, I'd, I'd like apologize to God. Like I, I was constantly praying. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, just that line from that REM song, Losing My Religion, it's like every waking hour I'm choosing my confession. Yes. That resonated with me so much at the time. I don't know how old you are. I'm 42, but I was about 16 when that song came out. And that's when I started. It was kind of waking up to stuff. And that song disturbed me because it was so close to home, to my thought life, you know? Yeah. No, I'm I'm 30 myself. I just turned 30. So I, I'm slightly less familiar with REM, but I do know that song. And that's exactly what it was. It was every day of, or every minute of every day. I mean, I was, and then being gay on top of it, I was so terrified that I was mm-hmm. going to hell. And that, cause I couldn't share. And again, no one wanted to be straight more than I did. No, mm-hmm. I was, I, that was the only thing I wished and asked for and prayed for. I missed something like 80 days of junior year in high school and 80 days of, uh, senior year in high school because I was so sick all the time. No one knew what was wrong, but I always had knots in my stomach. I had to be on anti-anxiety pills. And it was all because I was convinced that ultimately nothing in life mattered. So nothing could be fun because at the end of the day, I was just going to be tortured forever, you know? Oh my God. And that's not healthy. Ryan, you were in hell already. I was. You know, that's hell. That is the definition of hell right there. I'm so sorry. Absolutely. No, yeah, you're you're totally right. That was the it was the deepest darkest hell thinking you've committed the unpardonable sin. I mean, it was it was a nightmare. 
So I understand, I understand the, with the daddy daughter date thing, just to uh, recap, I understand the patriarchal idea of, you know, the man is the head of the household. Why? Well, the man has the penis. So therefore, you know, and that's going to lead us into Driscoll in a minute, but the method that they're using is weird. And wh- why can't you just sit down the girl or why wouldn't these people think, well, we're just going to sit down our daughter And we're going to tell her this is what she needs to do, or she's going to be a big disappointment to us. I mean, it seems like this is a very elaborate, very creepy thing that they're doing. And I can't figure out why it doesn't turn more people's stomach. I mean, have you ever gotten any feedback from other Christians about this, where they're like disgusted when they see these? Okay. Yeah, some. Um, I think that there are a lot out there who are disgusted by it, but I come from the South. I grew up in Arkansas and Texas and pageant culture is a big deal down there. I'm still Facebook friends with people from high school who, who post these things in sincerity where they're like, Oh, my husband. And here's our daughter. She's 10. They're doing their, their purity ceremony. And I'm just like, mother of God, protect that girl. If you're out there, you know, like this is terrible. And like, the only thing I can think of is maybe one day they'll wake up. Like I kind of recognize myself in that scenario and think, well, I made it through and, um, <laughs> yeah. it informed who I am, yeah. who I am now. And there, there are positives. I mean, it was painful, but I think that there's, I was able to, you know, if, whatever. I, I just try to hold, hold out a little bit of hope just to keep from offing myself every day, basically, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just how that goes when you see this stuff like that. So I wish that Freud was around today. Cause I'd love to read whatever he'd write about these events. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, so the daddy daughter stuff, that is some creepy, creepy, creepy stuff. Um, the other, the other main thing I wanted to talk to you about, there's so many subjects, but one thing that keeps coming up is, and it, it's, kind of related, I guess. You recently had posted on March 18th, it says, special announcement from the megachurch pastor putting on the Manly Men Conference. So there's this conference (laughs) called um, Fuel, Mm -hmm. and it's happening Friday, April 28th. And um, boy, when I look at that graphic, it's just just looking at the graphic pumps you full of testosterone, I think. I mean, that is a Manly (laughs) Men graphic. And I watched the video from this guy and he's, I guess he, um, I guess if you registered, you'd get some prize and someone won some Cabela gift card or something like that. Watching this man, to me, I think in another society, he would clearly be at least bisexual. Like he seems, he's trying so hard to be so masculine. Now I'm going to be super masculine because this is when, now I'm going to grunt every time I, uh, you know, every sentence I'll just grunt it. And it seems like such a farce when I listen to this guy talk. And that's partly why I don't trust certain, when I say certain Christian, I'm not talking about, you know, my friends and and people I know, but like in Christian culture and the church and stuff, because I know this is not how normal people act. And I feel like he's putting on a show and I'm thinking, why, what, who are you really? And Uh you're hit, you're pushing the uh, masculinity button so hard here that it makes me think that you're trying to overcompensate for something. And it's the same thing when I hear a guy like Todd Friel speak. Every time I hear Todd Friel talk, I think this guy is clearly homosexual. I mean, there's very little doubt in my mind. Now, he'd never admit to that. But do you ever get the feeling when you watch these like super manly men and that it's, it A, it's homoeroticism, or at least that's how it seems to me, but B, it seems like they might be overcompensating again for their own. What do you, what's going on in your view when you see these people? I'm, I mean, I, I think what you think could, could thou protest too much, right? It's, there's something about it where I, what I see in them is a disconnect and I, I'm not trying to psychoanalyze them. I just see it's so clear that they are speaking to a mold that they think they need to live into that this culture has pushed on them. If they were actually gay or bi and and were able to accept that they would present as much more genuine. And, and since they don't, you know, maybe, maybe he's, maybe he's not gay or bi. I mean, but who knows, you know, there's still something else going on. There's still some kind of disconnect where he's not honest with his pain. Like he's, (laughs) my son asked me a couple of years ago, he goes, I don't remember saying this, but he goes, why is Adam Levine such a douche? 
Adam Levine from Maroon 5, you know? Yeah. He goes, Mom, why is Adam Levine such a douche? And I go, oh, he's not connected to his pain. And I don't remember saying that, but my husband thought that was super funny. And <laughs> and and now I kind of think of that. I'm like, when he brings it up, I'm like, oh, yeah, well, that's kind of true, right? If if someone's not able to truly connect with their pain and the whole part of themselves, then they're not going to present as genuine. They're going to present as a bit of a douche and as insincere. So that's just kind of what I think might be happening with with just the whole setup and that guy's wife okay that guy running the fuel conference his name is eric dixtra and his wife's name is kelly and um that she's also a woman pastor at this strangely evangelical church i can't believe they allow a woman to be a pastor but it's a cult and so they have to win as much money raking as much money as they can so right. she has these women's conferences that are the equivalent of the fuel conference and it's called twirl and oh. they give away Manalo Blahniks and everything's about shoes and chocolate. And so it's another one of those, you know, what do women like? Women like shoes and chocolate. What do men like? Dudes like root beer and, and, and busting <laughs> each other's balls. And so that's just playing into stereotypes. It's all that they, they know. They, they're not connected to anything. And it's it's really sick. It's just sad. and uh, it, That's why it makes you feel gross because you've been there and you recognize that. And you're like, huh, what's going on here? Here's here's what I can't believe. I can't believe the acceptance of some of this stuff from, again, certain sects of Christian culture. The same people who will complain and be just appalled at lyrics from a Jay-Z song were defending Mark Driscoll basically calling women penis homes. How do you figure out what's going on with... Yeah, it's, you know, it's a brilliant plan of, of, of cult mentality. Um, knowing people who have been to Mars Hill and knowing people who have been to that church that Eric Dixter's at, the way that they were manipulated, it was just so Orwellian, the Orwellian slow drip, that you were able to make someone fearful of one thing and not another. Are you, t- sorry, you said Driscoll's church or Dixter's? Oh, both. I've known oh, people both. who've attended both of them. And it's just the same story, like the same ways they intimidated people, um, got them afraid to challenge. I had coffee with someone today who's who was completely shunned from Mark Driscoll's church, Mars Hill, because they just asked questions and you know, they were cut off, you know, told they weren't going to look them in the eye anymore, that sort of thing. Just brilliant manipulation because they know if they can cut out your emotional support, then, it, you know, people are going to cower to that. They're not going to really challenge that. Most people aren't. So. Um, I think that there's just a way to to attach it to religion and make them believe it. It's why so enough people are defending Trump and the and the hateful stuff he's doing, and they can still call themselves Christians. It's just well disguised self interest. You know, the thing you said about asking questions is really interesting to me. There, there's a guy who wrote for Psychology Today, Adrian Furnham. He's a PhD professor um, of psychology at University College London, and he's written about authoritarian personality. I read a book called The Politics of Denial when I was at university, and I was like, this is almost everyone I knew uh, from my childhood, whether it was family or from church. And he's talking about what he writes is he writes that at the core of the theories about authoritarian personality is the idea of a generalized susceptibility to experience anxiety and threat when confronted by ambiguity or uncertainty. So asking questions would be a big no-no. And he also writes, I'm, I'm going to quote this, uh, what he wrote in Psychology Today. He says, thus for various reasons, a person's ability and personality, their early life and current circumstances. Some people feel inferior and insecure and fearful of lack of clarity. Therefore, to avoid uncertainty, authoritarians dislike anything or anybody that advocates complexity, innovation, novelty, risk, or change. They tend to dislike conflict and decision-making and subjugate their personal feelings and needs to external authorize. They obey the rules, norms, conventions, and more importantly, insist others do too. He uh, also writes, they like simplistic, rigid, and inflexible duties, laws, morals, obligation, and rules, which affects everything from their choice of art to how they vote. So Mm -hmm. they're basically characterized by three things. The first one would be a strong desire to reject all ideas opposed to their own. The second one is a low degree of connectedness among various beliefs. And finally, many more complex and positive ideas about things and issues they do believe in, as opposed to those they don't believe in. So you can see how someone who is an authoritarian would not like questions. They can't open themselves up 
to complex thought or it's a threat. Yeah. It's a risk. It's a giant threat. It's, a, it's the biggest threat ever. I mean, I completely understand it because look how you and I spun out when we really questioned it. There's nothing more terrifying. There isn't. There really isn't. Mentally, that was like, that might be the worst thing I experienced mentally thinking, oh, what if everything I think is true is not true? Yep. Then who are you? Right. You know what? And um, I, I have a spiritual director that I meet with once. She's she's Buddhist, Quaker, Episcopalian. And um, she tells me, if you let go of your fear, you think you would be nothing, but you would be all. And I'm still wrapping my mind around that. I, I, I probably will be wrapping my mind around that for the rest of my life. But I've never known a life without fear. And so who would I be without that? That's such a core part of my identity. <laughs> You know, is it possible that I would be all, wow, okay, I'm going to have to hang on to that and think about that for the next 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it breaks my heart that there are so many people who their reasons for treating other people like shit, whether they're gay or whether, you know, wh whatever, is because they sincerely believe if they don't, they're going to face not only is the gay person going to face eternal consequences, but they themselves are going to face eternal consequences because they didn't do enough. And I know so many people who I would otherwise, I'm sure, be great friends with that have gone so far down the rabbit hole of fear that there's just no yeah. bringing them back. And yep. is that basically what was happening at the at Driscoll's church and Dykstra's church because these people based on what I've read based on what I've read from Driscoll and based on what I've seen of Dykstra these people don't seem particularly secure in themselves which usually is rooted in fear so mm -hmm. can you give some insight into maybe what people should look out for if they're in a congregation that there's going to be a tendency to just mm -hmm. try and manipulate the flock so to speak yeah uh, well my friend that I met with today, who was so involved at Mars Hill, she told me that her daughter said, why does Mark Driscoll yell at us so much? I don't think that's nice. Why does he make fun of people? Mm. She said that her daughter, her child was the first to pick up on that. Mm. And um, I think that it's our, you know, children are closer to their intuition than we are. You know, we adults, you know, as adults, you, you build a shell just to survive. But I just think that if you can tap into the vulnerable part of yourself and listen kind of with your, <laughs> I want to say that <laughs> what's that, that chakra that's right underneath your heart. Um, there's something about that part that if you pay attention, I really think that you'll, you'll know what your own truth is. As cheesy as that sounds. I think that if you can listen with that part of you, you will know, like, you know, in therapy, they say, pay attention to your body, your body keeps the score, it'll tell you if you're safe or not. And we had to shut that out. We had to ignore that. That's why your stomach was, you know, was a knot. Yeah, because it was holding all your attention, of course, like, where else could it go? You know, it had to honor what was being done to you emotionally. And so um, any attempt to make you think or feel a certain way, I you know, I'm very susceptible to or I'm sensitive to music in churches where they're trying to be over emotional. Like, I feel like, why are you trying to manipulate my emotions singing this hymn? You know, why can't we just sing it normal? Because you're making me feel like you're tricking me into something. <laughs> so even that, I'm just, I'm aware of that. And I think that's a good thing to go, okay, am I being, is there a hint of someone trying to control me in this situation? And why would they want to do that when this is supposed to be a scenario, a setting of faith and openness and community? You know, I have... So, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I'm done. Go ahead. Oh, okay. I was reading from someone. Actually, the first person who brought it up to me was my youth pastor. Um, at the last church that I attended, um, the youth pastor there, actually, he ended up leaving kind of for the same reasons I did. There was enough that was going on that didn't make any sense. And um, of course, this is quite a few years ago now, but he was the first one. And since I've read articles on this, but he was the first one to tell me about how everyone's being manipulated by the music. And he said, you walk in, you know, and they've got some, this upbeat, high tempo song playing, everyone's really in the mood and they're all so jazzed and happy to be there and the endorphins are flowing. And then they bring it down. Then they go into a slower song and it just turns you into like putty in the pastor's hands. And that's when they start passing around the plates. And everyone, of course, is feeding into each other. They're all um, legitimizing each other's delusion here when it comes to, well, what I would characterize as delusion anyway. And so 
everyone's in this like experiencing this deep like togetherness even though what they all think that they're praising uh from my perspective does not actually exist but it doesn't make any difference because with the music and looking at your neighbor and ev- and you just get swept up in the mood and then the plate comes along, you put your money in and then it goes right. And then you're putty in his hands for his message. So you're very susceptible to what he's then going to fill your mind with. And then before you leave, it's you and I experienced this my whole life before you leave again, we're back into the fun songs and da 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 da. And then you leave thinking, man, that's the best part of my week. I cannot wait to go back and give them more money. Yep. It is very manipulative. Isn't it gross? I mean, and that's, that's, a, you're describing why, what Jesus did when he tore up the temple. Mm. You know, the, the Greek says he called them fucking idiots. Like he was cursing at them. He had, he, he made a special whip to whip them with the money changers because they were taking the sacrifices that people brought to the Jewish temple. And they were, they were like, we're going to change this or, you know, we'll, we'll sell you a sacrifice at a small profit. And that just pissed Jesus off. He's like, they're making money off of this beautiful faith-based thing. And that's exactly the same thing. You know, that's, it's horrible. It's, a, it's the one record of Jesus really losing his shit and, and getting violent and saying things that Christians aren't supposed to say, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so well, he, They still do it. I mean, even in, in that same church, that last church I went to, the one of the associate pastor, whoever, his wife would play the piano and she would sell CDs in the church of her piano music. <laughs> I know. I mean, I've been to a million churches like that and you don't think twice about it. You're like, Oh, isn't that nice? They're you're like, Ugh. there's just something to it. It's just, why is that? Okay. You're turning, it's not the marketplace. This is the temple. And the thing, the two aren't supposed to mix the, the business. It's not supposed to be a business. That's just, such crossed wires so i i couldn't i was always discussed but even when i was a christian and once i became no i was still a christian at the time but i had a pastor come up to me at the mall and um i basically you know we had a conversation and i sent him away and he said well i've you've given me some things to think about and he said and he looks at me like he's a this mystical thing and he says i think we're gonna run into each other again one day and that was over 10 years ago now and So that prediction did not come true. But I was telling him, I was pointing out some problems I have with his brand of Christianity. At that point, I'd kind of moved on to, I was, I was really the only Christian at that point that believed exactly what I believed. Like there was no one else that was, it was either Christian culture, atheism, or kind of the version that I believed, which was basically, I was just, again, I was studying the, the, as close to we have to the source text as possible at this time. And I told him, I said, cause there was a, like a Christian supply store in the mall at that time. I think it might've closed since, but I said, Jesus, what if he was here today, he would have, he would walk into that store with a whip and he'd do the same thing he did in the temple. Literally you walk into that store and there is a barcode on the cross. Mm. Like what part of oh. that seems okay to you? Shit. Yeah. It never ceased to amaze me how many Christians I knew growing up. And again, the people I was surrounded by, they loved the Christian supply store. They loved going in and getting Christian memorabilia and, and whether it was figures or... They love it. <laughs> and why? I can't figure out. Exactly. Because it's because Christianity is consumerism to them. It's a bartering system. A very good friend of mine from childhood had told me about a particularly embarrassing moment where his youth pastor stopped by the house and his youth pastor was a relatively rational guy. Like he accepted evolution and not, you know, he, he, he just believed that, you know, God had caused it to, had, had caused life to arise through evolution and so mm-hmm. forth. So he, you know, he was a pretty reasonable guy and he, they had very honest uh, conversations. But this friend of mine told me that when his youth pastor stopped by the house, his mother just right away s- took this guy and was like, Oh, look at these Christian CDs that I just bought. See this one and this and blah, 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 blah. And it was like, it was, it was kind of like how you imagine like these posh millionaires with their Rolls Royces and stuff only in Christian culture. It's like all this, uh, Christian consumerism that they amass and it somehow is supposed to up their status in some weird way. Can't yeah. quite figure it out, but it's, uh, it seems like it's a pretty strange thinking and it seems like it has very little to do with Jesus and what Jesus oh, cared yeah. about. Yeah. I mean, you're, you need the, you don't need the CDs in your hands. You need the concepts in your heart. <laughs> as cheesy right. as that sounds, it's not going to do you any good, you know, on CD form or in book form. So what is, um, the biggest... I'm thinking... oh no, I'm sorry. I was just thinking of this. There's a Buddhist teacher 
named Jack Cornfield, and he told a story about monks that were um, taught to hold the sacred. I think they were Buddhist. They may have been Buddhist monks um, taught to hold the sacred text to their hearts mm. at all times. Um, so that when their hearts broke, the truths would fall into them. And I think that's so beautiful because once your defenses are down, once you've been through pain and really gotten to the point where you can deconstruct, then you're finally open to something bigger than the black and white that you've been taught is the only truth. Have you had any luck reaching reaching? any of these people who are fundamentalists that sometimes come on your page. I assume, I assume you probably get messages, not all of them very nice. Oh, I get, Oh yeah. People are mad. Um, well, it's funny. I'm talking again. I, I just met with some woman who, um, was part of Mark Driscoll's church, um, for very many years. And she was upset that I used to criticize her writings for Mark Driscoll's church. And then, you know, we recently met and she told me, I agree with you now and your writings help me help plant a seed and not your writings, but just the fact that we would question it and bring it to stuff Christian culture likes. Some people are like, wow, this woman is really misguided. This is really sad. She's mm. saying that you need to see your husband or, or whatever the teachings were that we were discussing. She said that that planted a seed for her now and she's, she's free from that. So, uh, you know, I do get feedback that some of these fundamentalist people kind of, it just made them think, oh, maybe there's another way to look at this. Which is all I want to do. Like, I'm not out to it's anyone of anything. It's just the only thing is like, maybe this isn't the truth. Just just if you can, if you leave with the notion that maybe there's more to it than this, then that's that's the only thing that I'm really interested in. I feel like I'm I might have made a mistake by not. We talked about um, Dykstra and who he is. Would you mind um, for anyone who's curious, because we've talked about some interesting things relating to Mark Driscoll. Would you mind giving a, like a, you know, a summary of who he is and just what had happened with his church? Sure. Mark Driscoll started a church called Mars Hill Church here in Seattle in about 1996 or seven. It was, you know, very small and then it grew rapidly and became a multi-site multi, you know, mega church around Seattle. Then it started expanding into different states. I think they have some global outreach programs, but it it amassed millions and millions of dollars. And it was a very big deal for here for a very long time. I knew tons of people who went to it, but the problem was I was, I happened to be in a group therapy, a group that had their women coming to therapy. There were specific women who attended Mars Hill church and they were very depressed and um, had really really dark ideation because they were told by Mars Hill Church they had to quit their jobs, get married, and have as many kids as as they could. And they were encouraged to homeschool. I think that Mark Mark himself didn't homeschool his kids and kind of made fun of homeschooling. But the general culture was, you know, you have to have these kids and homeschool them all. And these women were supposed, when they came to their church counselors, who were the only ones they were allowed to see, they had to sign a contract as a member, not to see outside counselors. That's another red flag. Um, They were told they need to pray harder and submit more to their husbands and that their depression came from their sin against God and their husbands from not wanting to. So this really got me on the war path against Mars Hill because I can think of no more effective way to destroy a family than to attack the mother like that. Had you attended that church? I, I went only one time in about 2001. And, um, my only takeaway was what a fucking douche that Mark Driscoll guy is. He talked about himself and wine for about an hour and how cool he was because he knows different types of wine. My husband had a different takeaway. He's like, our daughter is never going to a church where that man is <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because he, already, he, for some reason he like really picked up on the patriarchal vibe. I was more like, what a dickhole. But um, that was all I really had known of Mark Driscoll until that point, until I was reading the stuff. And I I started seeing it and I like feeling terrible for these children. I mean, the children are kind of the major victims here. So um, I'd started a, a Twitter account called at fake Driscoll, where I would just parody him. And that kind of caught a little bit of fire. And Mars Hill immediately sent me this email that with, used all this legalese, like one of their attorneys sent it to me and said, you're allowed to have this Twitter account only if you make it really clear that it's not actually Mark Driscoll. And so I just made that my Twitter bio. <laughs> Mars Hill told me to tell you that <laughs> this is, yeah. 
So there, it was just very paranoid. Um, and I just kind of he- kept at him because it was just really sick. They, they took in all this money. He used parishioner tithes to buy up copies of his own book. So he would get on the bestseller list. Right. And it was this horrible book about marriage where he talked about having visions of his wife, you know, sexually sinning before they were married. And he almost didn't marry her for that. And, you know, it was just because he had visions. Yeah. 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 Cause God showed it to him. So there's another red flag. Was it, was it, was it true? Did, did he ask her, did you do X, Y, and Z or was it just visions that he had? I don't, I think that she confessed to it, but I think it was just like, you, you know, like even if it wasn't, what it was, well, it's just it common could have sense. very well have been his paranoia that, yeah. oh, she might have been with another guy before me. I'm going to tell her that I saw this vision from God and see if she'll confess. You know what I mean? So, Well, that's the least shocking thing in the world for people to exactly. have a relationship. So it's not like he had to call in Scotland Yard to figure out maybe his wife had had a boyfriend before him. You know? Oh, yeah. It, there's just the way they treated women was terrible. They would They would call the husband and say, you need to control your wife. That sort of thing. Speaking of how they treated women, can you now talk about how his fall from grace, so to speak? How did that all come about? His fall from grace. I think that the final nail, well, he was disinvited from, he was asked to step down from Acts 29, which is this major church planning network. There, did you know there are, there are not 29 chapters in the book of Acts? There are only 28. And they called it Acts 29 because they're writing the 29th chapter with their lives. Oh. <laughs> anyway. He was asked to step down from that uh, shortly before the William Wallace stuff came out. And what's that for people who don't know? Okay. Well, well, William Wallace was the Braveheart character. Um, and this was turned out to be Mark Driscoll's secret name in these Mars Hill forums where he just went off. He would go off. And it was around 2000, 99 or 2000, that he would just verbally abuse members of his church in the secret <laughs> internet forum that they had. And he called women penis homes. In in this forum, and when that surfaced, it was kind of like, all right, he's done. It was we- he was really, really, and again, that was another time when I'm like, he is clearly trying to overcompensate for something. And even oh, yeah. some of the people on those forums were like, hey, buddy, like, mm-hmm. and he, he said things like, I'm going to come to your house right now, and I'm going to kick your ass. And you know, I think he might, I think he may have driven to one of these people's houses, and they had to calm him down, or it, he detailed it in a in the book, the Perf- confessions of a pastor or something. He kind of admitted to it, and that's how he was caught. It was really weird that he kind of outed himself on that one. But um, yeah, Mars Hill, he stepped down. And as a result, Mars Hill folded because they didn't have the traditional stuff. Like if had it been a Lutheran church or Episcopal or, mm. or something, there would have been things, <laughs> checks and balances in place where the whole thing wouldn't collapse. But that's the sign of a cult if the leader leaves and the whole thing crumbles, you know? Right. And so there was there $280 million in the Mars Hill Global Fund account, which was the special collection that they took for missions overseas and no one knows where that money went but mark has started another church in scottsdale arizona and it's a gorgeous 150 million dollar modern mid-century building that he bought with cash or uh, you know under mysterious circumstances and he lives in a mansion with a gated community hmm where'd all that money come from let's call in sherlock holmes to investigate there is a RICO lawsuit that has that is in place right now. Oh, it, really? Against Mark Driscoll? Yeah. So if you Google that, everything you can read about it. It's pretty interesting. But I do hope he gets caught for it. It would be so refreshing for once for one of these people to actually pay price for, for everything they did, but or at least some of it. These people, they don't seem to care that like the advice they're giving or what was happening at Mars Hill, like you said, it's ruining families. And I think it's because they think they're just so convinced they're right and any amount of pain or anything you go through in this life, it's just a drop in the bucket compared to the next one. So who cares, you know? Yeah, that's the ultimate leverage that you could possibly have over someone. If you can make them scared of the afterlife, then you can control them in this life. I've said many times, when I talk to people, Right away, I do it with the understanding that I am no match for eternal consequences. <laughs> There's just, I'm just not. You just, what, what could you ever say to someone to get them to, without fear, question their beliefs for the first time if they think that's going to give them a one way ticket to hell? Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I don't try to convince anyone of anything. It's like, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Just, um, they, some, you have to, it's kind of like, any addiction, you have to bottom out 
you have to hit rock bottom in order to really start to look at it from a different perspective. So, yeah. What, what do you think is the, what stands out to, if you had to choose one thing from Christian culture that you think is the most harmful or something that is, I don't know, just has struck you in some way more so than anything else. Is there anything that comes to mind in all the years you've done the page? I, I just want to, I keep going back to the word fear mm. um, and lack of connection. Those, those are the two concepts. I think fear keeps people from truly connecting um, fear of, of, for, you know, if you're gay and you feel rejected, that's because this culture is afraid of what that could represent, that they're afraid of your truth. They're afraid of your experience. They're afraid of something different from them. It's xenophobia is what it is. And so I think fear is at the root of that. And, and like I said, that's the opposite of love. And Jesus said, they will know you're Christians by your love. And that whatever we're seeing right now, that is not love. That is not whatever Jesus said. That's not actual Christi- ancient Christianity. That is a fabricated culture in the name of Jesus, and it's disgusting. So yeah. <laughs> that's kind of, I hope that's what undergirds the entire page. Yeah, and that and that really plays in also to the, because a lot of the Christians that I met, again, growing up in, in fundamentalist um, in that environment, authoritarian personality disorder extreme you know they as as the doctor said they obey the rules norms conventions and more importantly insist others do too and there can be you know it's got to be simple answers it's got to be a lot of these people they will because you wonder because because again i've it's like that quote i forget who said it but good people will do good things bad people will do bad things but to get a good person to do a bad thing that takes religion and mm-hmm. I've read that people with authoritarian personality disorder, they will, because they weren't reasoned with, oftentimes when they were kids, they were just beaten or hit or whatever. They can't, mm-hmm. they like have an inability to develop their own moral reasoning. And so what they'll end up doing is they'll end up, you know, as they grow up, they will pick out certain authority figures from society or from their inner circle or whatever, and they'll just deem this person to be good. And so then whatever this person says, is good. And I think that's why so many people support a party like the Republican Party that has so many positions that are literally anti-Christ, anti-taking care of people, anti, you know, b- being kind to one another, anti-equality. And it's like, well, no, the Republican Party has done such a good job of portraying themselves as the party of Christ. And all these authoritarians, they just don't know any better. Like, well, they're linked with Jesus in my mind forever now. So no matter what they say, even <laughs> if on the surface it doesn't seem to make any sense, they equal the party of Christ. So therefore, mm-hmm. it's going to be rationalized in my own mind in some way. And I don't know how you talk someone out of that. Uh-uh. No, they have to experience something something major to get over that. If you talk to a really truly spiritual person of any faith, they will be calm they will have this deep sense of peace. They won't have a a need to exert authority or control. Right. And that really stands out to me in contrast to the evangelical leaders and the pastors who kind of bark at you. What message do you have for any, or do you have one? (laughs) Like, I hope you've prepared a speech. (laughs) (laughs) If there's Um, any Christians who are troubled about, any idea that they have, whether it's about even the concept of hell itself or about maybe some of the ideas that they're being taught in their church and they're just scared to question anything for fear yeah. of consequences from the God they believe in and they happen to hear this. Do you have anything that you would like them to know? Um, it won't kill you. It'll feel like it will kill you to question it and to feel that fear, but it won't. <laughs> if that's any help. Um, if you've had an anxiety attack, you know that the feeling of, of impending doom is what elevates your anxiety and makes it feel worse. I've learned to overcome those by getting on top of the anxiety and ignoring the symptoms and kind of focusing on what is, is reality and is true and what I can, I can touch. And I would liken that to questioning your faith. And, and, and any kind of questions about what we can't, uh, about the unknowable. Um, there's endless levels of meaning out there. And maybe we don't need to grasp them all. Maybe, maybe we're okay just with what is tangible and what is true to our experience. So if we can honor that, uh, what we've experienced, and, and not internalize the self-hatred that Christian culture has put on us, 
I think that you'll you'll be moving in a better direction, as scary as it may feel. I couldn't agree more. How far would you say that you have developed certainty when it comes to your own beliefs? Do you feel like you're still like every day open to new things, or do you feel like you've got something solid locked down? I have a feeling it's the former, but I don't know. <laughs> um, I I feel like I'm always finding out new stuff about mm. different different aspects that I hadn't known. I mean, I'm, I I read a lot and I'm kind of addicted to, to just, I'm curious about a lot of stuff, I guess. And so I do a lot of reading and I, I, I'm not really, I'm not a place in my life where I'm threatened by other stuff. And so I wouldn't feel like I got anything locked down. Like I have my family, I have my, my friends, you know, a few close friends, that's all you need. And, um, that's really all I know for sure. So it's enough security to make me not be threatened by the, all the stuff I don't know, I suppose. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. Kind of before we wrap up, if you don't mind, uh, I, it's just so refreshing talking to you because you're not, um, I know that you don't have some, how do I want to say it? If it was a business, I'd say a corporate line. You don't have some uh, line ready, some theological like rebuttal, right? Like I know that you're just speaking honestly from what you think. So if it's okay, I did have a couple questions I was going to ask you, but I can only think of one right now at the moment that um, I'd like to ask you your view on and see what your answer is to it. Sure. So I think we've gotten this far that whether we want to call it a God, the universe, or or whatever, as you said earlier, do you believe that whatever the higher power is that you believe in, do you believe that that power interacts with us in our daily lives or wants to? Yeah, I, my experience has been, it does. Okay. Um, I can't speak for other people's experience, but I, I, I also feel like the soul doesn't need answers. The soul needs meaning. Mm. And so you're not going to find that in any kind of literal black or white, concise answer. I think that I, I believe in energy. I don't think it, it can die. I think it goes somewhere. And I think what you put out returns to you. I mean, that's, that's kind of scientific, you know, not, (laughs) um, so I, I feel like that completely resonates when you're talking about the, the spiritual or metaphysical as well as, as things like electricity or light travel. So, um, Oh no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Recently I heard a debate and the topic that came up that comes up a lot is the problem of evil. And Mm -hmm. Right off the top of my head, I guess this is really kind of the thing I'm most interested in asking you to hear what your answer might be. But every time I've heard an apologist in one of these debates give an answer to it, it's usually, you know, because someone will say, why would would God stand by and let a child be raped, for example? And the person will say, because if he was to intervene... That would, because he gives people a choice, that would negate free will. And and my response would be like, well, good, then I want him to negate free will. I, 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 yeah, yeah, that would be my response. Be like, I don't want to have enough free will to an extent to where children are being raped. Um, if that's the terminology we're going to be using when we discuss this. My question to you would be, how do you feel? What are your thoughts on that, on the problem of evil? Because if there is a God and he interacts with us, or a spirit or high power or higher power, or whatever you want to, however you want to characterize it. How do we square that away with why wouldn't this being stop certain, you know, really nasty atrocities from happening? And how do you feel about just what's your answer to the problem of evil or, or what are your thoughts on it? I think about it all the time because I work in an emergency room. Mm, wow. And I see a lot of the worst kind of tragedy and evil. On, inflicted on innocent people, mm. helpless people. And I think this is, this is why I can't completely say, you know, call myself a Christian or something, because what do you do with a God that would allow that? And yet I feel at the same time, I, we don't see the entire picture yet, but I'm not saying that in a way to excuse horrible evil acts. Right. I'm just leaving space for all the stuff I don't know that's out there. Um, sounds however like, much sounds like you hope that there might be something that will somehow. Yes, because there's some dark shit out yeah. there that no one wants to think about. No one wants to deal with because we don't have answers for that. We don't have, we don't have answers for suffering, but this is why 
Catholic cathedrals mean something to me is that they feature Christ on the cross, whereas mm-hmm. Protestant churches don't. They have kind of sanitized cross. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's something about looking at Jesus on the cross and the fact that he is feeling the deepest betrayal and suffering that I think there's a lot of meaning to that. And while I don't have an answer for the stuff I have to read, I do find meaning in, in solidarity with suffering. So I don't have a black and white answer for that, but I, I do hold this stuff and think about it all the time. I don't know is an answer that is so refreshing. And it's one that I'll say all the time when Theus asks me questions, I'll say, well, I, not only do I not know, but I don't know that anyone does, you know, I mean, sometimes we just don't know. So, I mean, no, I think that's a Possibly totally answer a question like that. You know, anyone who has an absolutist answer for a question about how could a God allow that? I'm not interested in talking to them, you know? Right. I, I just, I don't know. I don't know where I could go with them beyond that. So since you brought yeah. up Jesus, I would like to add, because that's kind of another sticking point. God could have just forgiven humanity or, or or done, you know, a series of things differently so that the, you know, in the beginning that wouldn't have required a human sacrifice. So is that kind of the same thing where it's like, well, I don't know why this happened, but this is just the way it's, he wanted it to happen, I guess, because that's a really troubling thing for not only, for, I, I even when I was a Christian kid, still like very young. I was really, really, really disturbed at the idea of everything that I was told happened to Jesus. I was like, why? Like, I would have called down the angel. Right. I think it's terrible to teach young children about the crucifixion. And I I grew up, like, you know, drawing him on the cross for Easter with blood coming out of him, and they put it on the fridge, you know? like that's 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 like an ancient torture device. The the cross was like a. I don't know if you know the theologian Gordon Fee. I really love him, but he's like the cross was was like a middle finger. Like it was an obscene symbol. Yeah. To see that, and it's been completely sanitized in our culture. So um, the thing is, Richard Rohr says that the cross will turn is what turns people away from Christianity wow. because we don't have an answer for suffering. Because there's how can you possibly explain it? Right. Um, but he has a book called The Naked Now where he says there are five things that that will like really drive you away and kind of push you into deeper meaning. And it harmonizes with Buddhist teachings, too, when you reach the things that you can't explain, like love, death, sex, suffering, eternity, like your logical mind can't wrap itself around those concepts. That's the type of thing that causes our literal brain, the binary part of our brain to short out. Mm-hmm. And either turn away from Christianity or, or spirituality because you can't wrap your mind around it or hold out possibility, which is very uncomfortable. Right. So you're so you're basically in the position where you're like, I don't know why this human sacrifice happened, but you're thinking that perhaps someday, maybe after this life, it will make sense or. Speaking of logic, that's the only logical answer I have. And that sounds really fucking illogical, you know, like maybe in the next life <laughs> well, I'll, I'll be able to hear it. But that's, I mean, that's the only, I'm not going to understand that in this life. I really am not counting on that. I, why would, important. yeah, I mean, yeah. Why would I, that just doesn't make sense. I, I have no idea <laughs> about that one. Sure. Yeah. No, that was one of the things that always troubled me. And like you said, I Definitely remember coming home from Sunday school, same thing with, you know, pictures of Jesus and just the blood and, but, but like in purple and pink and stuff and Easter colors. And it's like, man, <laughs> there's yeah. some weird stuff that goes on. Yeah. It's like speaking of normalizing violence. Right. Maybe that's why the Christian right is so violent. Yeah. That could Such be a why. Component of war, so violent and without love towards the marginalized who Jesus said to go towards. So if you had to sum up how you feel about your beliefs, would it, would it basically be, you know, there's plenty that you don't know or not sure of, but you just have hope. That sounds about right. And what is your hope in hope? My hope is that I will see every day I wake up and like, I just need to see evidence of love today. Okay. Yeah. That's all I need to get through each day. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. So hope in humanity. Yeah. You sound like a humanist. 
Yes, that's how I describe myself. People are like, oh, you're a big outspoken feminist. I'm like, no, I don't like the word feminist as much as I like the word humanist. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't have a big problem with the word feminist, but it does sound kind of polarizing, like like as in, in opposition to humanity. It's like, no, we know we it's about equality. It's right. about the whole person. It's about all of humanity. So yeah, I like I like the word humanist a lot. All right. Well, yeah, that sounds great. Well, it's I guess um is there anything else that you'd like to discuss before we wrap up? I don't I don't think so. <laughs> Thank you for having me on. It's been really nice to talk to you. Well, believe me, it's been my pleasure. So I've been speaking with Stephanie Drury. She runs the page on Facebook, Stuff Christian Culture Likes. <laughs> it is a great page. Oftentimes it's the highlight when I'm scrolling through Facebook. Um I, I especially like the other day I saw you <laughs> I saw you posted the uh, cross with the two revolvers mounted to it. <laughs> Yeehaw. <laughs> That just took me straight back home. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. And you also have the website. It's stuffchristianculturelikes.com. Yeah, that that's my blog. I haven't updated it in years. It's just basically a series of, of snarky essays at this point. But all the interaction kind of goes on on the Facebook page and on Twitter. Well, I hope that people check it out. It's I think it's a great content. It's entertained me for years, and it really resonates with me, given my own past and upbringing. So thank you again so much for speaking with me, and I am on Twitter, at ReasonBound. Do you also have a Twitter that you want to send people to? Yeah, I'm at Stephanie Drury, but my Stuff Christian Culture Likes one is at Stuff CC Likes. All right, well, thank you so much for talking with me today, and maybe we'll do it again in the future at some point. Oh, that'd be fun. 